your life, Dan. Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to our panel um, today. Um, the panel discussion will center on uh, global perspectives for responsible green recovery. I'm Professor Daniel Parsons, and I'm from the Energy and Environment Institute at the University of Hull, and I'm hosting and chairing this panel um, discussion. The panel will discuss global perspectives of a responsible green recovery. We'll look to cover environmental, fiscal and regulatory reforms that are needed to build back both greener and better following the COVID-19 pandemic. Later on today, through the rest of the, the rest of the, 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 the green recovery theme day, we'll discuss other things such as how places and regions play a role in this global agenda, the policy reforms that are needed by underpinning science in terms of delivering the net zero future that we all uh, know that we need to transition to. In the panel this morning, what I hope we'll do is delve into how a successful green recovery needs to address other things uh, as well in terms of a so more broader social justice uh, along with, with uh, a, a transition to a net zero future. The protection of biodiversity and nature in addressing climate change and how the two need to go hand in hand. And we'll explore things such as the roles of government, the roles of trade and trade unions, industry, academia and innovation in driving that transition to a greener future. I want to start and introduce the, the, the overall panel by drawing parallels between the pandemic and, and climate change more broadly. Both impact lives and livelihoods and, and have done so over, over the past year and with climate change for, for a longer period of time too. And both at their core or at their nadir have humankind's pushing of planetary sustainability boundaries at their heart. Both are caused by that and both are driven by those by those sustainability boundaries. The pandemic in many ways has put into perspective the challenges of reaching net zero actually are. We've closed down vast swathes of the global economy, but in real terms only achieved a six or seven percent on year reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And these emissions have largely returned to pre pandemic rates already, despite parts of the, the world um, largely um, still um, uh, to reduced economic output. So the 7% reduction that we've managed over this past year really does, I think, put into, into perspective what we need to do in terms of reducing uh, a, a, an on-year reduction rate um, and, and really hitting that by 2050 means that we need that 7% every year between now and our target date of 2050 to stay within the 1.5 degree warming targets. So, so a very, I think, um, humbling thought in terms of the challenge that lies ahead. I also want to positively highlight how the pandemic shows us a way towards some of these solutions too, however. How we've come together as a global community to meet the challenge, and that's got to give us some hope. How science and innovation has enabled rapid policy implementations in order to protect millions of lives and how that same science and innovation has guided and produced a set of viable vaccines that will save many more lives around the world. So we can raise this challenge if we choose to and choose a greener recovery into the future. And the pandemic really can be used as a vector to set a new trajectory in terms of fighting the broader climate crisis. So this morning I'm joined by um, a set of, of panellists to, 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 to discuss these aspects, what a green recovery should um, and will look like, and the sorts of things and implements and policy levers that we may have in terms of driving that greener future. I'm going to get each of the panellists now to introduce themselves and say a little bit about who they are, why they're here with, a, with an opening set of statements. I'm going to start with, with Simon Kemp from the University of Southampton. Thank you, Dan, and welcome everybody to the panel. Um, I'm very grateful for the invitation and I'm very much looking forward to this event. These types of events, I think, are really exciting in the fact that we are able to discuss matters with a huge range of people from a massive variety of different areas. Much We've got much more potential here than we have in what used to be the old types of events in just big lecture theatres with everybody traveling hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles. So this is one positive. 
Um, as Dan said, my name's um, Simon Kemp. I'm a professor in Education for Sustainable Development at the University of Southampton, where I'm also the university lead for Education for Sustainable Development. So one of my big roles is how we implement sustainability into every single dimension of the curriculum and also critically in terms of the student extracurricular work and looking at getting partnerships between students, staff and also local community groups and local businesses. Uh, I'm also a head of education in the School of Geography and Environmental Science and I'm the co-director of a carbon footprint in research group. Um, now, I'm going to come at this from a very deliberately biased perspective. Um, I see universities as being absolutely critical at the heart of a green recovery. I think that one of the most important things that we can do as a community is accepting just how critical knowledge, thinking, everything around the research and the teaching that we do in universities is really at the heart of society. Um, I think that we need to make sure that universities are part of every single discussion point, every single part of the path to a green recovery. That obviously has to involve our political leaders, has to involve business, has to involve trade unions, has to involve NGOs, and most importantly, we need to look at the expertise we got across all those different group as to how we engage with society. After all, sustainability, one of the things I would say right at the start of the first year for our programmes is it's not just about the fluffy bunnies and the rolling hills, it's fundamentally about people. That is what it's about, that's what the heart of it is. Um, I'd just like to um, support Dan's statement on the COVID disruption. COVID disruption, I, I saw that as really quite sobering. The fact that even though at the time, the height of the pandemic, the International Energy Agency were reporting a 25% decline in energy demand in full lockdown um, scenarios, and also only an 18% reduction in demand in those in partial lockdown, and those partial lockdown scenarios were much more stringent than we've got at the moment. That really made me quite frightened as to how difficult the challenge is. We always knew that the challenge was going to be problematic, but I don't think that anybody ever thought we'd ever be in a situation where there'd be a big red button we could press to stop everything. So as an experiment, it's been fascinating. But as you say, that 7% drop on annual emissions um, on a year and year basis is, is sobering, frankly. Um, it also showed the, the fact that we can't just go on the basis of shutting everything down as the solution. It's not consistent with sustainable development. It's not consistent with social justice. It's not consistent with economic justice. And it is no way of us addressing that change in society and change in the economy to lead to the 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius um, restrictions. Um, I'm going to frame this within climate change. I think that everything around the green recovery is framed around climate change in reality. I see that as being the biggest problem that we've ever faced as a species. I think that um, the pandemic is a massive challenge. And yes, we can take great optimism from the fact we've been able to develop some solutions. And we need to build on that optimism. COP26 gives us the opportunity, but it gives us yet another opportunity. We've had these opportunities since climate science in the 1970s and 80s. We failed to act. We've had we had agreements in 1992, but yet emissions have continued to rise by over 60% since then. We need to be cutting back drastically and we need to make sure that we are bringing all those communities I mentioned together. Um, the science is unequivocal. The science behind Paris tells us what we need to do. And whereas we know what we need to do, I don't see that we know exactly how we're going to do it yet. Um, we do, I've not come across sufficient robust evidence that all of the measures are in place to deal with those targets. Yes, we've got fantastic targets put forward by our political leaders. I was delighted that the government put forward the, um, the net zero by 2050, the 78% reduction by 2035. That's amazing. The United States going on to a 50 to 52% reduction by 2030. Interestingly, based on 2005 levels rather than the more challenging 1990 levels, but that's besides the point. Within that, we've got um, some great initiatives coming through. We've got the 10 point industrial um, plan and that's fantastic. But my problem with it is that it's, if you read it, it's full of this could, this could, this could, and the 12 billion pound investment there 
is dwarfed by the road building plan. Um, there's inconsistencies there. There's the illusion that we've got carbon capture storage as a central point of that plan, but we haven't got scalable proof that it can actually be a coherent and strong part of that recovery policy. And even yesterday, we had John Kerry from the United States stating that 50% reductions are from technologies that don't exist yet. Universities, businesses, society have to work together better because we can't just gamble our future on these ideas that we've got technological fixes some point in the future. So net zero, I'm not even 100% convinced that's possible at the moment, but where, where, what I would like you to see is that optimism to a green recovery, but that has got to be based on honesty. And that's where universities come in and it's got to be based on innovation and investment in reduction technologies that we know can work. Thank you, Simon. Um, next, I'm going to introduce uh, Sharon Burrow. Um, Sh Sharon's uh, uh, from the International Trade Union Confederation. Um, so, so Sharon, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, we had a pre-existing crisis before COVID-19. We had historic levels of inequality, despair, anger growing. You saw the emergence of an age in of anger with uh, uh, indeed exclusion of, so it wasn't just about income, although that was critical, it's about women, it's about race. But you also saw a climate uh, crisis. And so even before COVID-19, for the trade unions, we understand that every sector has to transition. What COVID-19 has done is showed us, in fact, uh, that without investment in resilience, in the critical areas of health, education, aged care, childcare, the resilience of communities, which is also about basic economy. And without social protection, then the world indeed simply deepens the inequalities. So we have now a major health crisis as well. When you're talking recovery, we have to have an integrated approach, all sectors, all sectors must transition, all industries. There's no doubt that if you're going to achieve net zero, you know, Simon's right. You can't put your fantasies on technology that doesn't exist. We don't actually need it. We have the technology of today to get to the targets that are vital, which are more than 50% of emissions reduction by 2030. And even though we've seen some good announcements, as Simon said in the last uh, few days, can I tell you that uh, of the NDCs to date, we are barely more than 25% of the way there in terms of 2030 targets. We are only at 12% of those governments recognising indeed that social dialogue, the involvement of communities and unions and uh, those people Simon referenced is actually there and only 8% on just transition. So to have a recovery that is about justice and indeed a net zero future, we need to see a recovery that's very different. For us, for the trade unions, that's a new social contract. It has five key demands. It means jobs, jobs and jobs. Unemployment is at historic levels. And uh, indeed, uh, we've got two billion people on the planet forced into informal work because we don't have minimum living wages and social protection, no rule of law. We have to repair the labour market, but it has to be climate friendly jobs with just transition. We need, of course, a floor of rights under the comp a fair competition floor under all global trade, all business activity, and the EU's due diligence uh, mandate will help that. The UN treaty will help that, but we need a very different approach to a model of business. We need, in fact, uh, fun, uh, a new, uh, universal social protection, and we need to help the countries with no social protection establish their systems. We need to fix those areas of inequality, absolutely giving people hope. And inclusion means meeting the net zero targets and, of course, uh, the SDGs. I would simply add Simon's right, finance is the poor cousin in this. If we don't shift finance from a view that you have a brown and a green economy to actually transition to a sustainable future for people and the planet that guarantees shared prosperity, 
we will simply see more disintegration, more uh, retreat into nationalism, more authoritarianism that's actually undermining our democracies. So a recovery that is just, that is in fact about uh, a net zero future and sustainability, but has people and their rights and their jobs at the centre is fundamental. Thank you, Sharon. Um, next, I'd like to introduce the audience to Ron Loveland. Uh, Ron is an energy advisor with, with the Welsh Government. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, all. Um, I am uh, the energy advisor to the Welsh Government, and one of my roles is to look across the whole energy spectrum from energy efficiency to nuclear power, trying to explore what our energy systems will be like in five, ten, 15 years time, not just at the local, regional, national levels, but also at the global level. And prior to the pandemic, I was privileged to visit Australia once or twice a year to see at first hand the Asian sphere focus. And I very much uh, agree with what Sharon has said, uh, that we have a long way to go. But my basic message this morning is the old but simple one that we need to think globally, but act locally. So if I might say a few words from the, the Wales perspective, um, you may not know that the Welsh Government is in a pretty unique space. We have legally binding carbon targets and essentially we need to halve Wales's current greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and then move to net zero as soon as possible. Um, we were one of the first, if not the first, national governments to declare a climate emergency, which has since been reaffirmed by our parliament. We have overarching well-being of future generations legislation so that with all our policies we need to look at their economics, social, environmental and cultural impacts. So as both uh, Simon and Sharon have emphasised, um, this is all about a, a just and fair transition. And last week following our election, we created a new new super Welsh Government Climate Change Ministry, encompassing the Welsh Government responsibilities for net zero, energy, environment, transport, housing and planning issues. This should really enable us to address in a joined up government way what a whole systems approach to help deliver net zero should look like, it, look like in practice. And almost everybody I, I, I talk to recognizes that you know that whole systems approach is going to be absolutely essential to uh, deliver uh, on, on net zero. In Wales we certainly do not have the definitive answers. I think we all, all on the call know we are you know, there are no silver uh, net zero bullets but a lot, a, lot of, a lot is going on Wales now to explore the options for a fair and just path to net zero which I'm happy to talk about in more detail in the Q&A. But just to mention two initiatives, one is the South Wales Industrial Cluster, in which we are working alongside uh, our friends in, in Bays with, and with our very economically important industrial operations across South Wales to explore their effective decarbonisation options, including uh, the very important carbon capture and storage. The other is we've just completed a in-depth Welsh Government consultation on what a hydrogen energy economy might look like. Um, we are also working with an extensive range of, of stakeholders on local area energy planning, local smart living options and regional low carbon energy strategies. So in respect to my one slide, that could be shown, if that's, if that's up, that's fine. Um, essentially, as Simon was saying, this is all about people. All of this work that we're doing in Wales, much of it linked to UK wide and other global issues, indicates to us the importance in tomorrow's energy world of a much more customer centric, locally focused energy system. This, for example, is shown in the slide for how the electricity grid in the UK can be seen from the bottom up perspective which we think will help provide many opportunities for driving the green economic recovery in Wales. We believe that delivering on such a customer centric focus, traditional whole system and just transition focus 
will enable Wales to be a globally relevant showcase. Um, I simply propose that the old slogan, think globally, act locally, has never been more relevant. Back to you, Dan. Thanks, Ron. That's great. Um, next up is, is Louise Smith, who, who leads Aura Collaborative Cluster um, for Innovation in, in the Humber. So, Louise, over to you. Well, good morning and thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. Know how many people are watching to know that this is just such an important issue for every single one of us. Um, my background is industry. I'm not an academic, although I do work for the University of Hull now. I spent most of my, I, uh, my uh, career in the dirty industries and in chemicals and oil and gas initially, but then trying to make them cleaner. And I worked on the two big carbon capture plants, Peterhead and Doncaster, and I think it's a fallacy that this is not uh, industry ready. It is, it just costs a lot of money. And frankly, I think people didn't have the guts to do it at the time, she says rather bitterly. Um, anyway, um, I'm now the director of Aura, an initiative of the University of Hull launched about five years ago, uh, working as a facilitator to accelerate groundbreaking solutions in tackling climate change. And we work with all stakeholders to collaborate from innovation. And that's a theme you've already heard from the other panelists. Uh, we work from our brand new innovation centre at the heart of the Humber. Uh, we have three key focuses, the talent pipeline, so people, research development and innovation and business engagement. And we believe you need all three of those working together to have the hope of a success. Uh, initially, we were launched with the focus on offshore wind. Uh, the Humber has the world's largest offshore wind farm just off its coast, as you all know. And the UK is leading the world in this extraordinary success. More than 50% of the UK's energy is now zero carbon and a large part due to the UK's commitment to offshore wind 10 years, 15 years ago. Our partners are from industry, other universities, and that's really important, regional and local government and other NGOs. And the key of this is collaboration. Um, I think a key enabler has been government policy over the last five to six years, starting with the clean growth strategy in 2017, followed by the industrial strategy. And then for the offshore wind, a key document was the sector deal, which um, drives this, um, this move forward. The net zero report in 2019 and finally the uh, green industrial revolution. So we are moving in the right direction and you absolutely need policy to be there. So why um, are regions important uh, in a, uh, a responsible green recovery? Um, so for the Green industrial revolution to succeed, I think we all agree innovation and collaboration are the lifeblood and universities are at the forefront of innovation, addressing great challenges of climate change through transformative ideas and importantly, extraordinary people. And they are. Um, they have an important role to play as anchor institutions. Um, for example, the University of Hull, uh, we contribute 2000 jobs to the region, indirectly about 4000. We contribute 370 million to the region's economy and to the, nationally that rises to just over 900 million. That's not insignificant. And if every university does that, we have a hope for change. Um, in addition to our main role, which is to advance education, scholarship, knowledge and understanding by teaching and research, we also have a significant and recognised role in the region by making strategic contributions to local economy uh, and the well-being of the community. As you will know, some of you, the Humber has um, a, a great poverty and uh, social injustice, and that's something that we are we is very important for us. But a key to this are the small and medium-sized enterprises, um, and we work with them. We, we work with them to turn innovative ideas into game changing reality to meet the climate change here in the Humber. In the UK, 99.9% .9 of companies are defined as small and medium sized enterprises and they contribute over half of private sector turnover. In the Humber, we know we've got about 30,000 SMEs and if only half of these are in the game, just think about what extraordinary things we can do to build back better with them. Uh, we, we run a number of grants through the University of Hull and we have over the last four years reached some 500 SMEs who to receive grants and additional funding. Over 50 of them are working with our researchers. We've created some 150 jobs and are moving in the right direction. 150 new products, processes and services are being delivered. And finally, all of this will generate some 38 million new sales for our partner businesses. So place is key to the green re uh, industrial recovery, um, building capacity for meeting the challenges we face. Um, 
The Humber's economy over the last century, as you will know, has been built on high carbon industries, so it's the right place to work on a transformation and a transition to renewable energy through innovation and collaboration, uh, creating a vibrant net zero economy and many high value jobs. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. And, and then fa finally, um, it's uh, Chris Skidmore, who's um, uh, the Right Honourable Member of Parliament. So, Chris, over to you. Um, thank you, Dan, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to speak uh, today. By way of background, I was twice uh, Minister of State for a University of Science Research Innovation between 2018 and uh, 2020, and I'm currently the co-chair of the all-party group on the universities and I was also uh, the energy minister temporarily in 2019 and had the privilege of actually signing the UK's net zero um, commitment into law in June 2019 and the, you know, the background for that was one where we just I think as the UK became the first G7 country a couple of days ahead of France but since then we've seen that net zero commitment being taken up by about 75% of the uh, globe's surface, and it's clearly going to be a target of focusing on uh, at COP26. Uh, um, today, actually, Dan, is my 40th birthday, uh, so it's a tremendous uh, privilege to be able to come and speak uh, here today. Um, and I think sort of turning 40, I hope you don't mind me sort of giving this anecdote, I sort of realise actually you sort of look back to when it was your own parents 40th and I clearly remember my father's 40th um he seemed very old it was 1990. now those 30 years like it or not have gone very fast and yeah you know, we go back to 1990 climate change policies you know weren't really on the agenda uh we were currently sort of pumping out 22 billion metric tons of co2 into the atmosphere now that's risen to probably around 50 a billion tons a year and since 1990 probably a, a total sum of a trillion tons of co2 have gone into the atmosphere um, my own daughter uh, will turn 40 in 2050 and we will have either made that net zero commitment or we won't have um, you know failure shouldn't be an option but the challenge we face is that actually yes net zero is fantastic by 2050 but it, this decade is the decade which will define whether we reach net zero or that we won't. And Simon has already alluded to you know, the John Kerry's comments, you know, have been repeated elsewhere by the politicians that half of the uh, net zero commitment would be made up of future technological advances. And you know, we have to hope that might be the case. Clearly, universities will be playing an absolutely critical role when it comes to the R&D development of those new industries, as Louise has mentioned. But in terms of the challenge for delivering in this decade alone, we see there's clearly an international challenge, but as Ron has mentioned, you know, action needs to start locally. And I passionately believe that universities as anchor institutions have the translational ability to be able to communicate to local populations the scale of the change that's needed and why it's needed. I think one of the greatest challenges for me as a politician is I see the polling around net zero. And just 4% of the population actually understand what net zero is and what it will involve. And that is a huge challenge because we can have these conversations and high level meetings in the UN. But how are we going to be able to take the entire population with us? And this is where I believe that universities have a critical role to play. We know that young people will be going to universities and become ambassadors. The climate change is the number one important uh, subject uh, for them. But how universities can then reach out and demonstrate, as Louise has mentioned, Hull is doing in a traditionally deprived community, how this can translate into the green jobs that Sharon's mentioned for the future is going to be so critical. And with this, I will make a plea for, for universities because it's not just going to be about the technological subjects. It's not just going to be about looking at engineering, science, technology, the you know, important though that is. It is a whole of society approach that is needed to be able to deliver on net zero and the humanities subjects, the social sciences will be more than important than ever before. And I need a passionate plea for governments not to ignore this fact because you know, I see I read books on climate change and everyone sort of says we've got to wake up, we've got to take action now. And we can you know, scream till we're blue in the face about the scale of the challenge and what's needed and the fact that emissions are still rising this decade. But unless we understand what is needed to 
curb the arc of policy to be able to change human behavior you know those are it's going to come from decision behavioral theories from our economists from our social sciences who are going to be able to understand how to unlock the human realization of what is needed for the future um, i'd like to talk in the questions about r d and what we can be doing also for research uh, capabilities for universities internationally but i do passionately believe if there are one institution above all it is universities that can act using their existing networks into local society as well as then international networks to reach across our countries they are well placed to be agents of change and be at the vanguard for delivering on net zero thank you very much thanks and, and th th thanks to everybody um for, for those for those uh, introductions and um opening statements there, there's already uh, a few questions coming through and just just to highlight to the to the audience that on on the live um on the live page um for, for the expo um there's a there's a chat function and then there's a q and a function if you if you scroll down on your pages you you you'll find the q and a box there where you can post your questions through to us and um, we will keep um, we will keep an eye on, on the chat as well, but um, most of that's at the moment being dominated by happy birthday wishes to Chris. So, um, so, so, so but, but please do keep the questions coming through. Um, and, and, and with, with that in mind, the, the first one that's caught my, my attention here, and, and just going back to, to Simon, your, your piece around interdisciplinarity and, 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 um, and education in, in the main. Uh, the question is, what are the panel's opinions about cultivating a greater interdisciplinary mindset? Um, and what aspects can universities play within within that? So, so Simon, maybe maybe just start with your your perspective on those. Thoughts. Thanks, Dan. Um, th that's a great question. Thank you. And yes, happy birthday, Chris. Um, I, I'm seriously impressed that you're taking the time on your 40th birthday actually to be involved in this. It shows that you are committed to it, and it shows you understand the urgency of this. So, thank you for that. Um, interdisciplinarity is absolutely everything when it comes down to, to a, a green recovery. A, a green recovery which is climate focused cannot be achieved in isolation to just through technology as Chris quite rightly said. Um, I was very much struck by Louise's comments about um, saying that we already do have the proof that the technology can work but we haven't got the, that level of investment in terms of that scalability. That comes back to people understanding within society. Chris's point about so few people within society understanding what net zero is. I remember going all the way back to, because uh, I've been lecturing an uh, academic at Southampton for 25 years now, all the way back then I've always been talking with the urgency of the issue and it gets more and more urgent and people are always saying that you must have loads of students coming through doing climate based degrees, everybody's interested, everybody realises the urgency. It's never translated into numbers. When you talk to our, when you talk to many colleagues, many students from different disciplines, they frequently don't understand the interweaving of all these different disciplines and the need for us to understand behavioural studies, the critical nature of the humanities involved in this, the critical nature of restructuring the economics curriculum, um, everything around forming those linkages between every discipline the university is involved in and making sure you can you can communicate it through whether it be through the sustainable development goals and um, focusing deeper on the climate crisis we can't involve we, we can't do it without, without uh, dealing with health and well-being within the population and um, bringing people out of poverty working with the businesses all of these are all different individual academic disciplines that unfortunately sit in silos um, Many of you will have probably heard that famous quote by the environmental philosopher David Orr um, talking about education, the, the plunging of the planet has been the preserve of people who are not uneducated. It has been the preserve for people with PhDs, MBAs, MAs, MSEs, BSc, BAs. Education historically has equipped people to be more effective vandals of the earth is that famous quote and there is a lot of truth behind that and we need to reposition the university education system around that. We need to bring everybody working together in that sphere. So I think it's it, it's the most pressing issue that we've got within universities because once people graduate, you actually show 50 or 60 worth of contribution to society and industry. Think of the power of that collective change if people understand 
all the disciplines that work together, not just the academics in the institutions, not just the not just the, the business spin-outs and industry groupings in the institutions, all of whom are critical, but the students lie at the heart of this. And unless we get the structures and innovation right, how can we expect the students to respond to that? That's great. Thank you, Chris. And, and just, just building on that, another question that's come through that caught, caught my eye was, was, of course, that only 40% of, of, of folks right now go go to university. So, so how, how do we how do we then um, educate around net zero to, to, to broader society and, and, and interactions with 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 with, um, with with companies, with industry, with other sectors? And may, maybe Louise, you'd like to to build out from a university perspective in, 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 in that area as well. Well, yes, and I, you know, I, I, as I set out in my opening uh, words, SMEs are a key way of doing that. You know, lots of people work for them. This country has predominantly um, SMEs, and until we can help them understand how they can help the wider society, and many of them do. You know, in the Humber, they're very, um, they're very rooted in the Humber, and they see themselves as. Um, helping people with jobs, you know, in in we we the tiers are the 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 work is sort of the lower tiers. So we we are focusing on level three to level six, um, and I think um, working with SMEs has enabled us to help to understand how SMEs work, but also help understand how we can help them. And it, you know, many of them wouldn't even think of knocking on the door of a university for a bit of research, but it can be anything, small, bigger, and and we found that when we have managed to to sit down with them. It's a it's a win win situation for everybody. Um, and I think, you know, um, it's that collaboration that has to be generous. Um, it can't be about personal ambition. We work with other universities and many of you might say, well, the University of Hull's not very high up in the uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, the the leagues, but we've worked with Sheffield and Durham and Newcastle and it, they win too. We win, they win. Everybody wins. And I think it's the same with SMEs. Um, when one of the things that we're looking at uh, investing in more is apprenticeships. That scheme has not worked. I think it's a shame. I think it's because it was perhaps too complicated. I'm not an expert in the air, but to be able to work and earn money at the same time, surely universities should not be too snooty about that um, and, and can be involved, whether they run them or can help run, you know. So I think there are a number of things that can be done um, and, and really just giving SMEs confidence. We find where we've launched a big net future net zero survey. So you may know that in the consumer industry, they do lots of these surveys because you and you then build an insight model and you know that you've got these people are going to buy that product. It's very rarely done in business to business because it's hard because, of course, it's companies, not people. Um, and we're looking to to run that so that we get a big enough sample to really understand where our 30,000 SMEs are in terms of low carbon. Um, I think Chris mentioned, you know, it's understanding what that actually means, um, that we all have a role on a small scale or a big. We all think it's got to be big innovations. Well, it can be many, many small incremental innovations which will make the real changes. That, thanks, Louise. And, and Chris, maybe this is one for you that's, that's come in and I have to admit my, my ignorance here. But um, thinking about younger generations coming through and um, the, the uh, amendments to the Education Act proposed by uh, Lord Knight um, uh, around embedding more of more of this kind of critical um, uh, climate change aspects in, into into schools curriculum. So, uh, wh wh where's did you did you know about that and and, and the progress that's been made there and the role that could play? Um, I haven't seen Lord Knight's amendments, the actual uh, words themselves, but I I guess I would say, you know, it, it is often in my ten years uh, as a member of Parliament it, that there is a sort of knee jerk recourse to saying, well, let's just load this onto the the curriculum. Let's sort of say we've got to add. And I find sometimes that to be, I, mean, you know, I like Jim a lot, but, it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the strongest policy response. You know, over half of all schools and our academies don't necessarily need to follow the curriculum. Uh, I think sort of, you know, trusting sort of the teachers to make these judgments, actually, I, I find my sort of uh, children at school at the moment, you know, they are sort of learning about the climate and, and making sure that, you know, there is space for that you know, is important. But you know, giving the teachers the flexibility to weave, you know, climate science, you know, in, into all subjects is something where I've sort of come from a bit like sort of financial 
uh, education. But you know, Jim is right that we, we've got to create a pipeline of, you know, one, highly educated researchers who are going to want to sort of take forward the sort of next stages of, of research. And, you know, we've got this sort of 2.4% challenge also of you know, spending 2.4% of gross domestic product on R&D just to sort of keep sort of swimming along in the OECD average lane. Um, but we need about 200,000 extra uh, people doing research either in academia or industry. Uh, probably more industry uh, and obviously a lot of that will be related to sort of you know green technologies um, you know that aside we obviously want to change behavioral you know, aspects of the population you know I think one of the greatest challenges we're going to face is getting rid of uh, gas boilers in the next 10 years and how we can try to you know, explain to young people what's going to be needed to be changed in their own individual sort of households so there's sort of two prongs to it. One is obviously trying to create the pipeline for individuals to sort of take up the subjects that are needed. And secondly, the sort of wider societal awareness. Um, but I would say that the curriculum is often sort of seen as the sort of touch point where we can achieve everything. It's not. Um, you know, by all means, we, we got to look at how to embed uh, learning, but that can be done you know, outside of just simply tweaking the curriculum. So that, that, can that, I come in here? Yeah, please, 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 please as, do, Sharon. As please, a please. former teacher, I definitely agree with Chris that you trust the teacher. But can I tell you that we think that there has to be a legitimacy, indeed a demand, such that teachers feel confident to actually put curriculum in place. There's fantastic materials from very young children's literature, through to indeed the scientific end of serious senior uh, curriculum. But with the Education International and the ITUC on Earth Day, we launched a call for everybody. And I suspect that's where Lord Knight is also responding to, for everyone to endorse the notion that there must be climate curriculum, that teachers must be equipped to actually do as Chris said and integrate that curriculum where it's uh, most important in an interdisciplinary sense in young, with, for younger students as, and as a specialist curriculum for older students around the scientists. But it really is critical that we not deny the reality of understanding our world and indeed some of those small changes that can be made by individuals in how they shape their society equally as our demands on government. So I would just say, one for the curriculum. It has to be that we all learn about what's the basis of uh, the drive to change our future and what are the possibilities available now. Thank, thanks, Sharon. And if I if I stay with you, there's there's another question here that I'd kind of earmark to start start uh, with, with with you on. Um, and and that's the um the, the the question goes as follows: um, How do we balance a need for expedient action? with inclusive processes, particularly given that sometimes the objectives can be at odds with one another? Well, I'm not sure they need to be. You know, frankly, I get impatient with the slowness of the transition. If you take heavy industry and you have uh, unions at the table, do we really want to keep uncertainty in the transition, whether it's steel, aluminium, cement, electric cars, whatever the mix of the technological uh, transition is, or do we want to have a plan that's transparent? Just transition is actually very simple. It means people are at the table helping to co-design the future, but it also means for older workers where there is displacement, and there will be, that secure pensions are in place. If people are nearing retirement age and they choose to retire, a bridge to secure pensions. And of course, as others raised earlier, you know, the skilling, reskilling, um, redeployment, and of course, income support through that transition with renewal in communities. You can't get people to trust that we have to make these changes and they have to be at the speed we need in the next uh, nine years to stabilize the planet and then beyond without transparency and trust. So, communities have to look like there's a future for them for their children, their grandchildren. So that's why we say it is about jobs, jobs and jobs, climate friendly jobs that are of course our decent work with rights and social protection in line with goal eight. That's great, thank, thank you, Sharon. Um, and then just, just kind of thinking about 
broadening, broadening that out and what that means in terms of the instruments that we have, certainly in the UK context. And Chris, I was wondering if you could say a little more about um, so, so, so some organisations such as Innovate UK, for example, um, and all tax credit schemes that incentivises SMEs um, in, in, in the line, alignment with with what Louise was saying. Uh, can, can you say some things around how, how some of that that, that poli policy instrumentation at that level can, can really help drive the change we need? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I'm glad someone's just asked that question because you know, traditionally we do very well on the R, uh, less well on the D. Uh, and you know, Innovate was initially established to try to encourage that sort of uh, Business facing opportunity uh, that uh, is, is needed. And I you know, would say, having worked closely with Innovate, um, that I wish they would be given sort of more flexibility and, and freedom uh, outside of sort of the umbrella of UKRI to be able to recognize you know, opportunities. Uh, what I would say is that at the moment, Innovate sort of act a bit like a delivery mechanism for uh, grant making opportunities. There's a sort of bit of opportunities for loans as well, um, but they're quite small pots of money. And this is the problem we've got in the UK is that the funding cycles are almost annually. That companies are chasing small pots of money that sometimes aren't even worth it for the actual bureaucracy and administrative uh, process they need to go through. You know, I would move Innovate across a financial cycle of maybe five to seven years by which they've got the flexibility to be more agile, to talent spot, to act almost like a sort of venture capitalist organisation and to be able to help grow SMEs and work with them and recognise that you know there are certain companies at certain points of, of travel on their destination. You know, some are desperate for a 10K uh, grant some are need need 10 million uh, and so what I would say is innovate should have a far bigger budget you know with that I would also make sure that the catapult network which is under the umbrella of innovate is given a far greater reach you know if you look at sort of and part of this is it's been established the catapult network for 10 years you know it has done very well as the recent review has shown but it has about 250 million pounds a year to, to spend on its operations you know it, a lot of these areas that like focus on materials, for instance, you know, one of the critical drivers uh, for a green recovery is going to be looking at the alternatives to cement, to steel, you know, all these high CO2 producing sort of industries. And yet if we could sort of, I think, sort of actually in increase the budget for the Caswell network from 250 million to 2.5 billion so that we place it on the sort of Fraunhofer level with Germany, we could achieve so much more. There is so much capability that's not being matched by the capacity uh, that is limited um, at the moment within the network and innovate can play a critical role in that in helping to shape the future and an expansion of the catapult network and then just finally in terms of tax credits obviously we've got the tax credit review on r d tax credits at the moment you know that's looking at so how to expand outside of the frascati definition of r d so that we can maybe look at data and some of those issues around sort of cloud operations which will be very helpful i think for smes to be able to upscale their operation given we know how important the digital sphere is now for some of these technologies but what I would say is one policy lever I would like to introduce myself would say well, you've got the R&D tax credit is 11 percent, I think, at the moment. It might go up to 12 percent in the next year or so. Um, but why don't we focus on having a green R&D tax credit that is perhaps maybe double that to 25 percent or even beyond? So actually you're using the tax system to try to really advance and reward those uh, companies that are doing high level R&D in the green industries in particular. That's great, that's Chris. Uh, Lu Louise, is there anything you yeah, yeah, of there? Just, just I I just wanted to make one point on something Chris said about, you know, Innovate UK. And, and I think the catapult system is great, but it has one thing that it does. It focuses on the two top tiers. And that doesn't work for a region like the Humber, where the, you know, and then it, there's a complete separation between the two top tiers and big industry and the smaller SMEs who actually drive the economy in somewhere like the Humber. And so therefore, I think you need a pincer movement. Yes, you need the national huge influx of money, but you need organisations who know the grassroots organisations and know the SMEs. They, you know, we've done some qualitative research. They will not go to an Innovate UK. They will not go to a catapult. They need 
their own people helping them. And then another piece of interesting information, a lot of the the uh, financial um, comes from from uh, the LEPs, the local enterprise partnerships, for example, and they've never run businesses. So they don't understand. And you're right. You know, sometimes they only need 10,000 or even a thousand pounds. And sometimes they need. But there's a, a, a need to build that capacity and that confidence to help SMEs understand their role. And I think we need to focus on the lower tiers now, not just the top tiers. Um, there's one there's a question that's come in here, and I think that, <coughs> that, that, that Ron's probably best place to, to start with. And it, it talks about the role for um, energy demand reduction. Um, so, so thinking through the, the, the re reducing cars, improving housing stock, and um, all of these sorts of things that we can do around um, uh, consumption. Um, so, so what, what can be done around around thinking thinking through how we reduce demand ra rather than rather than the the innovations to continue as as, as we're going, and, and how can that be positioned within a a green recovery? Thank you, thank you, Dan. I'll I'll, I'll come to that in, in a moment. If I could just make a couple of comments on the dis discussion so far. Don't forget, in terms of customer engagement or consumer engagement, the role of local authorities. Uh, they are trusted by the citizens generally. They have a very important role uh, with their climate uh, emergencies and what they are trying to do in their in their region and here in Wales. Uh, they are working very closely with our, our universities to drive the whole uh, net zero agenda. And if I might introduce a bit of controversy, can I disagree with you, Louise, in terms of catapults? My experience, particularly with the offshore renewables energy catapult and particularly the energy systems catapult, is they are doing a very good job at getting to the SMEs. Yes, they need to do more. And yes, uh, and we're working in Wales to do more for what we call our foundation economy, which would, you would class as the second tier SMEs. But I, yeah, um, Innovate UK, I think, plus the catapults in an expanded role, and I'm privileged to sit on Patrick Valance's Net Zero Innovation Board and that this is all being looked at very seriously in terms of scaling up uh, whether it's a factor of 10 has been described or not is a matter of our, our friends in HMT um, but there is a lot going on in that space and also you know Innovate UK is working now with Ofgem on a 500 million pound program uh, to uh, improve our grid networks because without the right grid networks, we are not going to achieve under zero emissions. Coming to the energy demand reduction side, yes. Um, I think it's the, coming back to our, our universities and technologies, I think the role of digitalization is absolutely key in this space. We need to know what is happening in our businesses, in our homes, and if you listen to the Laura Sandys, who's you know doing a great job on the whole digitalization agenda in conjunction with Bayes and the energy systems catapult, once we have the data far more available, then I think demand reduction will come into play. Yes, I mean the, the slide I showed earlier indicated that you know uh, we need to work at the local level on energy efficiency on our homes. In Wales, we have a very powerful optimised retrofit programme, as well as working with universities such as Pacific on new energy positive buildings. Um, but it all comes down to both you know, knowing what we've got, using the digital world much more effectively, including AI, and not only looking at the technology, but the marketplace and the market players. Um, and you will see new energy services operate uh, offerings coming onto the market, which will hopefully revolutionize the demand reduction space. But um, for that, there are, there are good companies out there, um, as many of you will know, but we need Ofgem to be more liberal in allowing those companies to make the offers that we as citizens actually want. Uh, and there are some big, big, big challenges in that area. Thank you, Dan. Dan, can I put, put please, in please a point there for cities? Because people often look at this in silos. Yes, every industry has to transition, 
But if you're looking at cities in that concept of what are the local organisations, and you have to build livable cities, recognising that the demand and supply catalyst from our cities is actually going to generate not just industry and services within the city limits, but indeed more often out into the hinterland to the, the, the communities, whether they're rural in your nation or indeed offshore. And so just getting that circular economy capacity for livable cities that indeed meet the test of zero emissions and looking at how we invest in cities, because at the moment it's a great hodgepodge depending on the size. But I was struck then by the comment about the role of local authorities. They are trusted. And again, if you have everybody, unions, community, local government at the table and you map the demand and supply catalyst, then you actually have a much more integrated approach to a, uh, a capacity to manage a circular economy future with jobs, with uh, social protection, with the uh, fundamental public services within those uh, communities. Thanks, thank Sharon. And, and and maybe as, as as we move into the last five minutes here, I think I think there's a there's a there's a question here that's that's rather long, but I think it distills down to um, driving confidence um, and how we instill confidence within our within our leaders, both both um, that those those centred on policy, but also within industry and and within 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 research and academia as well. So so maybe maybe a reflective um, uh, question to. To, to the panel around around how do we how do we provide that confidence that this is the thing to invest in this is the thing to to to, to really that, that they will see this this progression in and, and support behind a, a green recovery and if I, I maybe pitch that at Simon to start with. Thanks Dan. Um, well it goes back to what we've been discussing previously about um, making sure that people understand the urgency of the issue and also understand the scale of the likely impacts that will be a result of not addressing this and the opportunities that lie at the heart of this in terms of really raising economies, raising social justice, because there's great opportunities to be had here. But wrapped up within that is the whole issue of climate anxiety as well. And we need to be very, very careful. Uh, it's a very fine line between pushing forward the urgency of this issue and making it so overwhelmingly frightening to people that you think, well, I can't do anything about this as an individual. Um, we've got, we're just going to hand it all over to our leaders. Well, they think that other things are more important. So we're just going to keep on putting this off to the future. So um, I'll keep it at that because I appreciate we'll run out of time and others would want to have a say as well. Thanks. So I've got to address it. Thanks. Anxiety. That's great. Um, Chris? So and I think that there are two aspects to this. One, I you know, take a historical lens and say, what well, you know, where can we learn from the past in order to deliver on the future wide scale sort of transformation, both at sort of government level and how that works down at the local level. You know, I would say this is the equivalent of beverages sixth giant uh, for the 21st century. And, and you know, with that in mind, how can we learn from, say, for instance, you know, the creation of the NHS in terms of the buy-in from the general population to support the NHS. I mean, you know, putting sort of politics aside here, you know, what I think has worked so far with the climate debate is the regardless of which sort of side of the political debate people come from, everyone recognises the, the need for, for change and, and how to step up to the challenge, but then how to sort of cascade this down at a local level, yeah, I would say there's huge opportunities now. The knowledge exchange framework has been published uh, for universities to act, and there probably will be funding opportunities that will sort of uh, originate from that. But you know, the knowledge exchange framework is not something you're going to sell to a local sort of population, but it might help sort of create a a sense of how you can get that sort of ambassadorial role of you know agents of change in the local community working to deliver local projects that are going to, to, to change. And I think sort of some of those you know, lessons you know, will be needed. Uh, and we'll also have to look at how you know, we can engineer the grant system and also maybe the R&D system so that we measure this more effectively. You know, I think how we measure impact for the future is going to be really interesting because uh, you know, the, the ref at the moment you know, doesn't necessarily measure, you know, measure the social impact of some policy changes that, and, and also 
um, yeah, research opportunities for universities. I think we can engineer the social impact uh, better into the ref and across a whole number of uh, university um, grant schemes then and, and funding opportunities will, will empower universities mm -hmm. to be those anchor institutions and, and I think step up to a, a green civic role. Yeah. You know, universities are doing so much already when it comes to tackling some of the sustainable development goals. Uh, you know, actually, they're well placed to translate that work across into securing a green economy. Yeah. That's great. Thank, thanks, everybody. Unfortunately, that that brings us to to to, to the end of, end of the session. I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of opportunities through the week to kind of continue the discussion on on many of the themes that we've we've started here. But it just leaves me to to say thank you to all of the all of the panelists for your time and contributions this morning. And and, and also thanks to um, what I hear is a, a very large audience out there listening in. So so thank, thanks for tuning in. Um, of course, the, the Green Recovery Day continues um, that there, there's a short break now to, to refuel and recharge. But um, the, we move into the parallel sessions um, shortly with with green recovery, investments, entrepreneurship, inclusivity in a green recovery and solutions start so mitigation solutions um, session as well. So so please do continue to tune in to the uh, to, to, to the, the expo and, and, and thanks once again to everyone for coming along this morning. Take care. Bye.